Hello, hello. Welcome to our next Facebook Live looking at Curse of Honor, which is out now to buy in paperback in the US and it will be out in the UK next month. And you can get it on ebook globally now, right now, go and buy it. Uh, today, uh, I am talking with uh, David Annadale, who is the author of Curse of Honor. Um, hello. Hey. Um, so for anyone who's new joining in, I'm Angeli. I'm the marketing manager at Aconite Books. Uh, I do most of the social, well, all of the social media stuff. I do events and promotions. Uh, I run Facebook Lives where we do interviews and Q&As, um, live chats, sometimes live play games as well, uh, if I can get everyone together. Um, thanks for coming by. Uh, David, do you want to tell us uh, a little bit about yourself? Introduce yourself to anyone who may not have... Uh, across your work before? Well, I uh, have written extensively for Black Library on the uh, Warhammer 40,000 and Age of Sigmar lines and some Horus Heresy as well. Uh, I also have a few other books uh, outside of uh, Black Library and Aconite, uh, Gethsemane Hall, uh, the, the the horror novel, so if, uh, for something seasonal. And I'm an instructor at the uh, University of Manitoba where I teach uh, English and film and video games. Awesome. I didn't know you also did video games. That's exciting. <laughs> Very nice. Right. What's your favorite video game? Halo. Uh, right. I was going to say, hey, funny, I must be programmed. I said Halo. In fact, I meant to say Fable. Yeah. Fable. Oh, I like Fable. That was like one of the first ones I got on my like super old Xbox. Like, that was that. It and Halo were the first ones I got with my Xbox. And I have oh. this big gap because I went, uh, my, the, the previous console I had before the Xbox was a Telstar. Uh, so it was a uh, it, it was an almost apocalyptic vision uh, to sort uh, of jump from one to the other. I, I don't even know what the test was. My first. It had, well, um, it had <laughs> variations of pong. That was the. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. It was a very. It was an early. I was going to say early eighties. No, a late seventies console. <laughs> Quite, quite, quite a leap then, yes. To go Pre Atari. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, let's jump in and talk about the book then. So uh, for anyone who's watching who is not um, knowledgeable on the Legend of the Five Rings, which is the um, FFG setting that this book is set in, um, can you tell us a little bit about the the world, the, the land of Rukujun? Well, it is certainly a very heavily uh, influenced by uh, feudal Japan, uh, it, though it, it is a, also a, a, a fantasy setting. So we have uh, so so the the geography is, is obviously imaginary, and we have all kinds of supernatural events that uh, and characters and figures uh, inspired by uh, the Japanese mythology. Uh, it is a land that is uh, riven with all sorts of political intrigue, uh, with the different clans uh, all, I, I wouldn't say at war with each other, but uh, jockeying for position uh, in the uh, in the, the kind of court intrigue that, uh, uh, that, that you would expect in any, any kind of very large, complex society. Excellent. I realise I haven't actually showed off the cover for the book, so I'm going to do that as well. Uh, right, so this is Curse of Honour then. Uh, so, while this is up, uh, do you want to give us a quick summary of the book then? Um, you know, what should people expect? Um, yeah. Well, it's a... Uh... A, a, a dark fantasy uh, with the uh, bordering uh, on f full on horror at, uh, at different times. The, uh, the, the setup has a member of the uh, crab clan, Hida Haru, who uh, is, he's the, the heir of the, uh, the throne of the striking dawn castle, but he isn't actually very good at uh, what he's supposed to be doing. And he's very, uh, very painfully aware of this. And so when he stumbles across a mysterious city or the, the ruins of a city, he makes a number of, well, regrettable decisions uh, which unleash chaos uh, upon the Striking Dawn Castle. And the, uh, the, the, his errors as they compound need to be dealt with by uh, Barako, who is uh, one of the 
primary uh, guardians of the uh, of, of the castle, and uh, she has to hold everything together as everything starts falling apart. Um, I so I what so what what is the the crab clan then? Because you you mentioned this this clan. Mm -hmm. I know that the setting has um, it's five obviously for the five rings. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about the crab clan? They are certainly very hard pressed. They are the clan who is responsible, uh, that is responsible for protecting uh, the realm of Rokugan from the, the Shadowlands. They are the ones who uh, garrison the wall that keeps the evil forces at bay. The, their la and lands are right next to the Shadowlands, so their lives are. Uh, ones of constant hardship and struggle as they deal with the perpetual encroachments or attempted encroachments by the forces of darkness. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so what made you pick Crab Clan and the, the, the Striker Dawn Castle as your sort of main sort of center of the story as it were? Well, anyone who, who knows me at all, uh, wouldn't be uh, too surprised that I went this way since uh, my interests skew towards the dark and the horrific. <laughs> and uh, of all the clans, the uh, Crab Clan is the one that uh, has to deal with the dark and the horrific on uh, a, an almost daily basis. So the, and, and so uh, if I was interested in that sort of things, then I, I'm gonna be interested in the Shadowlands and oh, who lives right next door to the Shadowlands and has to deal with them, Crab Clan. And that, um, it also appealed to me the uh, the, the well, I think the, the, the fortitude of, of the clan, the uh, that this this there's a kind of stoicism that I associate uh, with them. In that it, it would it would be easy to imagine uh, collapsing in despair given what they have to face all the time, and yet they don't. Uh, they it, it becomes a, a source of strength of, for them. So there's. But be, because of their, their certainly their, their situation, there's a lot of drama that just arises naturally from that, and it uh, gave me a, a chance to delve into the the more horrific aspects of the L5R mythology. Yeah, and you can from the the cover of the book, you can you can kind of see that there's going to be some something evil brewing with that green glowing light if it's a green glowing light it's always evil <laughs> it's, never good. it's never good and i have to say that uh nathan elmer's cover was uh, i mean i love it to death but also uh, i was in the very fortunate situation of s seeing that cover when i was still only part way through the writing of the book and so it was it was my constant companion in the uh, in the writing I was able to, with uh, very few tweaks, adjust some of my descriptions of the city to match what was on the cover. Mm -hmm. And the the looming figure in the background really helped uh, solidify and establish the mental image I had of Baracko and how she uh, is both a, a physical and a moral presence uh, in, in the book, both, I, I hope, for the reader, but also for, for Haru. And uh, for he, because of the, the, the this this immense presence that she is in his life, that's one of the reasons why uh, he makes the mistakes that he does. Yeah, I I mean I really love this cover. I know Nick, uh, who's uh, put a little quote there, say yeah. it's a killer cover, uh, has had it as his background on uh, one of his <laughs> since since I started and probably before then. Um, yeah, because it's beautiful. And um, then the next sort of one in this series of the Legend of the Five Rings uh, stays along the same sort of vein. And uh, we're going to be showing that one off next Tuesday. Um, and it's, it's real beautiful. <laughs> I mean, all of our covers are really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pick them. But yeah, this I, lo I really love this one. I love that. Yeah, just the, the glowing evil that everyone is sort of like down there in the snow looking at and being like, oh, dang, we've got to go there. Curse <laughs> <laughs> you, Haru. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 my, my jaw dropped when I saw that cover for the first time. I was just, yeah. just over the moon. Uh, okay, so let's talk about honour. So it's the main theme of this book. Um, so what is honour uh, within the book? 
um i know it has like many different paths that it sort of looks mm -hmm. at um so, well, do, oh sorry no no go oh. <laughs> it takes on different forms with, with different characters. So if we stick with our, our two primary ones, uh, Haru and Baraka, Barako, uh, with, in the case of Haru, it's uh, where I would say the, the, the curse uh, really lies. It's through it, primarily a misunderstanding of, of honor. It, it takes the form of pride with him, the, the, uh, the sense of being well-respected. And... And there are reasons why this has happened, uh, why, why he's gone awry with, with regards to honor, because, as I, as I said, he's aware of not being particularly good militarily uh, as, as a leader, and yet this is the role that he must play. That, but that's getting mixed up with um, the, the sense of others being aware of his shortcomings and therefore the kind of injured pride that, that comes with that. And so in an attempt to repair to to do better he's also overcompensating and leaning towards doing things which he thinks will make him look good which is the the, the wrong interpretation of it in the case of barako there uh it's more the, the the sense of honor in doing the right thing for the collective uh even when that does mean that there are things that uh, perhaps at a personal and emotional level she would rather do differently but that she knows, given her responsibilities, which extend far beyond her, she cannot do those. So, so that 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 personal cost might be a, a kind of curse. But uh, I, I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't want to to emphasize that too strongly because if if there were, uh, the decisions that she has to make, the the honorable ones, if she were to make them over again, she would do the same things because they are the right things to do. So. Uh, but because she is that kind of, again, uh, from Haru's perspective, her honor would seem to flow naturally, right? Like she just, it, it's effortless uh, for her. It's not, but uh, it it is from his perspective. And someone with that kind of uh, skill and moral stature can become, or can be intimidating for someone who is lacking those. Right. And so there, there's an element of intimidation, even at the same time as a, there's an idolization as, as Haru is uh, is in love with her. And so all of these things get tangled up in his misapplication of the sense of honor. And uh, we have a question from the audience. Um, so um, a random linkage has said, uh, would David like to write more within the L5R setting? Or are there any other aconite properties that you're interested in? Well, yes to both. Uh, <laughs> I do have some ideas for uh, a, a, a follow-up to Curse of Honor. So uh, they're, we're working with those uh, now. So I'd very, very happily return to this setting. Um, as for uh, aconite's properties, every time I see a press release of, oh, yeah, we have this property now, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, my instincts, oh, I want to write that, and that, and that, and that, uh, this kind of uh, magpie uh, desire to overcommit. Yeah, I feel like Gloomhaven would be a good one for you. you oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then going to pull the, you know, I've, I've been sort of circling around, oh, you know, get the, the, the 500 pound game box. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'm talking about weight, not cost. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, that's a, wait, what a setting that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be playing the Jaws of the Lion at some point. I've just, I've just got it. So I need to, it's like a smaller version, which okay. teaches you the rules as you go. So yeah, that's, that's my next one for sure. Oh, okay, so uh, okay, so without giving too much away, um, who who is your favorite character that you wrote in the book? It would be Baraco. Uh, she, um, uh, I mean, though Haru is the uh, the instigator of everything that 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 get, happens, Baraco is the true protagonist of the novel. And I really enjoyed spending time with her and everything that she has to wrestle with, which is a considerable amount, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so um, you write a lot of time fiction. What is your favorite thing about writing uh, fiction within someone else's world? 
the the image that I've I've often drawn upon to talk about the difference between uh, tie-in fiction and, and non-tie-in fiction is two different kinds of sandbox. Uh, in the uh, in the case of tie-in fiction, it's a sandbox where there are already all kinds of wonderful toys in it. In the case of the original fiction, it's just it, it's just a sandbox, and you have to uh, create all the toys. So when you get to the, the sandbox, and there are all these wonderful toys, then e and each of them pushes your imagination in different ways. So it's like being given this wonderful treasure chest, uh, just exploding with story ideas. Uh, and uh, it's like, well, which which toy do you want to take to <laughs> run in, in which direction? Uh, and so it always, it's, it's a, a privilege to be able to play with those wonderful, wonderful toys. How, how do you choose a toy then? Because you'll stay there and I'm automatically panicking, like, how do yeah. I know which one to play with? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I, know. I feel like some of you, uh, my dog looking at her toy box and just you know, <laughs> paralyzed at times. But uh, I mean, it, you know, sometimes, of course, the, to the toys are cho chosen f for you, right? They, uh, the editors would like you to work on one particular story or, or another. And, and that helps because that, that, you know, sometimes you have too much choice. Uh, where do you go from there? But at the same time, there are, well, in this instance for with the Crab Clan, right? It's... Uh, this particular toy is, is is painted black and it's got all kinds of jagged angles on it and uh, uh, looks very spooky. That's the toy I want to play with. <laughs> yes, I suppose, yeah, in this setting, yeah, that would be the, uh, yeah, <laughs> the scary toy, please. <laughs> yeah. The scary toy, that's the one I'm going to want. <laughs> so are there any other, like, challenges for writing in time fiction? And how do you overcome them if there are? Well, uh, be, coming back to the the image of the the toys in the sandbox, they're not your toys. They're someone else's toys that you are allowed to play with for a certain length of time. But you can't break the toys because someone else is going to want to play with them, and mm -hmm. uh, you have so you have to and you have to respect the toys. Right? You don't want to uh, damage them either uh, to twist them into something that they're not supposed to be. So the with, 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 then with time fiction, it's not just a question of you can't kill off named characters, uh, for example, uh, but respecting the lore, the, the the spirit of the world, the setting, the the, the kinds of characters that uh, inhabit it, and 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 taking it seriously, right? So that you you you're not going in with the sense of it's just a game, it's just a toy, it's just a yeah, the phrase "it's just a" should not appear in your imagination as you sit down to to write this this book, this this story. Uh, it is it, to be taken as seriously as any other kind of, of of writing. And I mean, I I have a I've loved time fiction since I uh, I was very young. I think the very first time fiction I read was John Burke's Hammer horror film Omnibuses, where he he did novelizations of The Reptile and Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and things like that. So uh, it's it's always been an important part of my life, and mm -hmm. the pleasure that it gave me was a, a profound one. And I, if I can do give someone else the same joys that uh time fiction has always given me and uh i'd be very happy and i realized that i've, I've gone somewhat uh, away from from your question but i guess it does boil down to this idea of of respecting the work that has gone into creating these worlds and characters and being true to them and hopefully you know adding to the the, the enormous collective legacy that all of these different realms have. Yeah. Especially with L5R, it's not just, it's because it's a card game and it's also an mm -hmm. RPG. So it does have like huge amounts of lore and like yeah. people are very um, sort of not precious, but they, you know, they love their clan that they play, mm -hmm. whether it's a card game or, or their character within the RPG. Like I've seen people with like clan tattoos and like also they, they really love and represent yeah. their, their clan and you probably don't want to upset them either no, <laughs> if, no. if they love a particular character or setting and you try and wield it to your own story and yeah and upset yeah them. well that's it yes it's it's your it is you know it, it's you, the story that you're writing is is yours in the sense of, of of the creation of it but it's not yours in another way because it uh it belongs to this setting and yes you 
you know, my, yeah, uh, especially with uh, uh, this amount of lore, you know, you, you, you're worrying about the mistakes that, that do creep in. Uh, but any that that appear uh, certainly are are unintentional uh, on my part. The my goal has always been to be true to this this glorious world that uh, uh, that that is L five R. Yeah, and I and we're all I mean Akamite and our authors we're lucky that L, uh, FFG uh, do work with us um, yes. very closely. Um, and Katrina. Um, She's so wealth of knowledge on these things, and uh, I know that she sort of goes over everything with a fine tooth mm -hmm. to make sure that we uh, <laughs> don't upset the narrative that they've got planned. Well, and her her feedback on the manuscript of Curse of Honor was enormously helpful and really helped uh, to re reshape some some misconceptions that I had, uh, especially as a you know, as a first time uh, author of of you know, well writing this realm for the mm -hmm. first time and uh and really helping me understand what is going on in this world what things mean at a, at a much deeper level than uh than i had had initially right i'm gonna open up to the chat if anyone has any questions they would like to ask before um uh we show off your next aconite book which is very exciting um so Curse of Honor is available now in paperback in all good game stores and um, bookshops across the US and Canada. Um, and it's available in ebook everywhere that you can buy an ebook um, globally. And next month it comes out uh, in the UK. So you can uh, pick it up if you're in the UK and you're sad that you don't have it in paperback yet. You don't have to wait long, it's just a couple more weeks. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions they want to ask, please do jump in the chat. Um, I know that Lottie said that she was going to try and pop in um, and say hello. Uh, I don't know if she's there. Lottie, <laughs> come there, wave and say hello. Uh, if not, I shall uh, show off uh, the next book and you can do um, just a small snippet of what, what to expect with that because we'll do another live chat when it is uh, okay. out. But let's... Uh, show everyone <laughs> our next book the harrowing of doom dr doom marvel untold do you want to tell us a little bit about this one uh first it's a book where i'm still pinching myself uh, about the fact that i got the chance to write this uh as i never tire of telling people dr doom is my absolute favorite marvel character bar none and so writing this i kept thinking i i'm writing dialogue for dr doom i'm making him do things it's like is this real um and so this is uh you know, very briefly then uh dr doom who uh every year has to fight a duel uh with with a demon to free his mother's soul from hell and he always loses thinks he has found a way of getting around this particular uh trap and well, things go badly. Let's put it that way. <laughs> It'd be a very short book otherwise. Otherwise, yeah. So yeah, there are a number, there's a number of people for whom things just don't go well. <laughs> I really love this cover as well. I love how bright it is and how very much like a comic book it mm -hmm. feels. It so is. Each of our marbles has their own sort of look to them. And this one is very much in keeping with their uh, classic comic look. It does, and uh, but as well, the the very gothic character of uh, Doom himself, uh, with that gigantic billowing cape and the, uh, the 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 suitably towering castle in the background. So uh, yeah, yeah, I, I love, love that it. cape. <laughs> it's just yeah, like... a great cape. <laughs> well, <laughs> Lottie says things go badly. <laughs> <laughs> So on uh, Friday, or tomorrow, uh, we're going to have some more about the Harrowing of Doom up on our website, including a um, brief interview with you that we did very much earlier on in lockdown <laughs> when I had less things on. I was like, I'm going to do all these interviews. <laughs> um, now it's much busier, much, yeah. much busier for me. But um, luckily we got that. So that's, um, so that's going to be going up tomorrow at lunchtime on the Aconite website. So if you are interested in finding out more about the book and, and seeing the cover in 
big, <laughs> then uh, do pop over to our website tomorrow. Um, unless we've got, oh, have we got any more comments? Oh, there we go. Oh, random right, linkage again says, did Aconite give David a choice of Marvel characters to write about, or was he just lucky? There's a bit of both. I uh, There were a range of characters that we could pitch for, and as soon as I saw that Doctor Doom was one of them, uh, I, I would have moved heaven and earth and uh, launched a number of covert assassination attempts in order to uh, get to write that character. So I, I pitched my heart out and uh, was fortunate enough to get a green light. Right, okay, well, with that, we uh, yes, can sign off. Um, thank you very much, David, for coming along. Is there anything else that you want to plug at all whilst you're here? Any other books, non-acolyte books that uh, people should go see and find a few? Or Well, uh, since it is October and Halloween's coming up, I will mention my Warhammer horror novel, The, the House of Night and Chain, uh, which is also currently, the audiobook version is in a humble, bum, humble bundle, uh, so uh, you can get it inexpensively as well. Sweet, excellent. Perfect, well... Thank you, everyone, for turning up and for hanging out with us. Um, and I shall see you all uh, next week. Yes, I'm doing another live next week. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to send us a Facebook message or uh, hit us up on Twitter. Um, if I can answer them, I will answer them. Lovely. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.